Hello everyone and welcome to the lecture on drafting the research paper introduction. In this lecture I'm going to be going over several models that you can use to structure the introduction to your research project. We'll also be having some embedded assignments within this lecture so that you'll be able to create some notes that you can then use to write the introduction. So please have a sheet of paper or an open document nearby so that you're able to make some notes as I go through this lecture. Before we begin looking at certain models for introductions, I want to remind you of the purpose of the introduction within the research project. You're going to be setting up the problem that will be solved by you. They're setting up your original contribution to this ongoing conversation on your topic. So remember, this conversation is already happening. It is out there in the research and then you have to actually contribute something of your own into this conversation that makes your research significant and meaningful. So to do that, you have to already be able to say what others have said about your topic, and then you're going to give your own perspective. So introduction should really include three things. An indication of typical assumptions about the issue. Assumptions would be commonly held knowledge, common beliefs by those who haven't done any research, or typical expectations for the genre, for example, what people would expect for film or for music. Then you're going to also need a challenge to those assumptions. What has been overlooked by these typical beliefs? What will you show readers that they haven't thought of before? And essentially what that leads up to is a statement of your final thesis. What will you teach readers by the time they finish the paper? How will you change those assumptions? What should they do to change? Um, or how will you solve the problem? All of those questions need to be answered within your introduction. And we'll be using several notes and then structuring them into models to help you get all of that information into the intro. Now, at this point, you should have done some preliminary research and you should be collecting all of the sources that you're going to use in the final project. So when I ask the following questions for your writing assignment, I want you to be thinking both about general research that you've looked at as well as assumptions in the public that perhaps aren't touched on in the research but that you know based on your personal experience. So at this point you may want to pause the lecture so that you can go through these questions and write down some answers for yourself. And I'll read them out here. Number one, what are the typical assumptions an average reader would have about your full topic? Not just the social issue, not just the pop culture forum, but the so social issue plus the pop culture forum. What is common knowledge in the public about your full topic? What can you expect readers to already know, if anything? Will they have any potential biases in how they think about your topic? Number two, what are the typical expectations a reader will have about the pop culture media specifically that you chose? Will most readers have experience with that form of media? Do they know its conventions and how it works? What will they expect to see or hear when using that form of media? And as an example I have, if your topic is war and film, what would a viewer expect specifically from films? If your topic is gender and TV ads, what would a viewer expect from ads? So what I mean by expectations is the experience that they have with that pop culture form. So for film, I would expect to go into a film and hear music played. I would expect that there would be loud action sequences in a war film in particular. I would expect to be entertained. Um, I would expect that there would be famous people so on and so forth. So what are those expectations that are within that pop culture form? You want to identify those in case that becomes part of how you're overturning the expectations for your reader. Now you also want to think about the expectations for the social issue and not just the pop culture form. So what are those typical expectations that a reader might have about the social issue that you chose? Will most readers have experience with that issue or not? Do they know a lot about it? What are the most common held beliefs about that issue? So for example, again, if your topic is war and film, now you're gonna focus just on what viewers know about war or readers know about war. If your topic is gender and TV ad, what would people expect when they're looking at gender in particular? What are the stereotypes that people might have about gender or how much knowledge do they really have about it? 
So think about those expectations in terms of just the social issue now. Number four, how will you challenge, break, or change your reader's expectations about your full topic? What have they overlooked or forgotten? And I really want to emphasize this one because this is your contribution to the conversation. It is the reason for your research and the most important part of your work on this project. So you need to be very specific when answering this question. What is it that you have learned that has been missing or that needs to change or that you're going to challenge? There needs to be some point for why you're doing this project and it's up to you to identify what it is about your full topic, the social issue and the pop culture form that you are going to speak to and make an argument about and how are you going to break or challenge or change these expectations that you've just identified in questions one, two, and three. Number five, now is a good time for you to state your final thesis. Remember, you've already drafted a working thesis for the proposal, but this may have changed when you collected your sources and started doing research. So this final thesis version needs to take into account the whole look at what you want to do in terms of pushing your um, own contribution into this conversation on your topic. So this will be the final argument that you want to make. And I have some questions that you might want to answer here. Will you ask readers to act on the information that you give them? Do you want to propose a new phase of research? What do you want to happen once readers finish viewing your project? So think through these questions and think about what your results should be. What do you want the reader to do when they finish reading your project? Should they go join a committee somewhere? Should they run for office? Should they um, advocate for a particular thing to happen within pop culture? What should they do or think or what kind of assumptions do you want to challenge or break? So these questions really have to be answered in order for you to be able to identify what your argument will be. So try to articulate that argument then in a final thesis sentence. And you may want to look back at the models that we used in order to um, put that into words that work for you. I want you now to think through your own rhetorical appeals as you get ready to start writing this final project. I want you to determine what your personal primary rhetorical appeal will be. Remember, effective writing is going to incorporate all of the appeals, appealing to readers through logos, ethos, and pathos. And you're probably already comfortable using one of these appeals more than others. And just as a quick reminder, pathos is appealing to people through emotion. That's targeting the audience's feelings. Logos is appealing to the audience's logic, targeting their sense of what makes sense. And then ethos is appealing to your own sense of credibility, establishing your own authority to speak about the issue that you've researched. So choosing a primary appeal will help you choose an effective introductory model, which we'll see in just a moment. I also want to remind you about joining the conversation and what that means. So your book describes Kenneth Burke's metaphor of a parlor conversation as demonstrating how academic writing works. So as you start writing this project, I want to remind you of what Burke was discussing. First of all, you want to give context for the ongoing conversation. You can't assume that your readers know everything. Even if you've identified these expectations that they might have about your full topic and all the different parts of it, you still within the project will need to remind them what those problems are and what is at stake for your topic. Number two, you always want to use good ethos by fairly representing all parts of the conversation. You don't want to silence other points of view simply because you don't agree with them. That makes your research biased and therefore less reliable. Instead, you want to present alternative perspectives and then show why they don't work. So you can agree with what works. You can point out inconsistencies in the conversation and say what doesn't work. And then you can criticize and explain what's missing. But in order to do that effectively, you have to have good ethos and show the full picture of the conversation and not just your one side. And then number three, don't forget your own voice and that your own experiences have authority. You have lived with these issues, you have used these forms of media, and your experiences may not be represented in the research that you found. 
you can argue from your own experiences about what is missing or how things need to change. So be confident about that and make sure that your voice is very clear and that it's different from what other people have already been saying. Don't just echo critics and rehearse what has already been said, but really distinguish your point of view by drawing on your own experiences and your own um, lived authority that you have about your topic. Let's look at the introduction models now that are coming from your textbook. In each one of these cases, I've given you the broad overview of what your textbook has discussed in terms of introduction models. You're going to see my notes that tell you to see the examples in the textbook. I haven't provided annotated examples in this walkthrough of how to write introductions because those are actually included in your textbook in a way that they weren't for our earlier essays. So please be sure that you have your book and that you can look at those annotated examples to see how these models are working. So the first one that your textbook describes is the inverted triangle introduction. In this kind of introduction, you can think of it visually as an upside down triangle where the wide base part is at the top and it's narrowing down to the point at the bottom. You wanna begin with that broad description of a brief history of your topic. Now this is not the same as the historical overview that will be in the body. This is just that typical expectations. Here's where the conversation on my topic is um, in the past and here's what I'm going to be talking about. So narrowing to those typical assumptions after you've given just a brief nod to history. It's not going to be as detailed as the historical overview that you'll do in the body. Then you're going to narrow it even further to the thesis, how you will change, challenge, or break those assumptions. So this introduction is really relying on logos. If that's a primary appeal that you're very comfortable with, this might be the type of introduction that appeals to you. You can look specifically, as I said, at the example in your te textbook to see how that works. For this kind of introduction, there are a couple of things that you're going to need. First, you want to have a clear history of the problem with your full topic. Again, the social issue plus the pop culture form, um, making sure that you understand that there's a concise but very full history of that you're able to impart in this introduction. Then you want to have that definite set of assumptions that most people have for your topic. If you weren't really able to identify those earlier in the lecture with the assignment, this might not be the best type of introduction for you to use. And then finally, you would have a thesis that argues for how you will change the conversation on your topic. And in most cases, your thesis will be this one, um, whether or not you use this introductory model. But if this is one where you're really having a clear sense of the argument about how you want something to be different, then this might be the type of introductory model that works for you. The next one that your book looks at is the narrative introduction. This is telling a very short story that draws readers into your topic. So it's a different type of rhetorical appeal. Rather than giving facts and history, which is what that inverted triangle introduction does, instead we're going to appeal to the reader's pathos by describing the issue through the lens of a story. Then you're going to transition from the story to the problem concerning your topic. So the appeal to pathos means that you're going to write something that makes people feel something and that gains their interest in it. And you can again look at the example in your textbook and see how that looks different from the previous model. So for this type of introduction, you need an engaging story. This can come from describing the action of a film, a TV episode, or another media form. It doesn't have to be personal, but it is more effective when it is personal. So if you have a personal experience, for example, with your social issue, and then you can make that connection to the pop culture form, then you might be able to tell a very short story that makes this connection for readers and helps them to see why it matters that your social issue is representing um, or is represented in that pop culture form in a particular way. You also need that clear transition from the story into the real world problems that the story demonstrates. For example, a problem with the way film portrays gender. You might describe issues of gender and then describe how you see gender being portrayed and how this becomes a researchable, arguable problem because you've had this personal experience that is demonstrated in the story. After that clear transition, then you need your thesis and you need to be arguing how you're going to develop that conversation on your topic, right? So if I've shown you this story, I've told it to you, here's what the next step is going to be. Here's what should be done to solve this problem and to make other stories possible. So it's a different type of thesis and a little bit different focus, but you're still going to be arguing for some type of change. 
So again, appealing more towards people's pathos or emotions. And if you feel comfortable doing that type of writing that is a little more on the creative side, this might be the type of introduction that works for you. The next type of model is the interrogative introduction. For this one, you're going to formulate an intriguing question about your topic. And then your project is going to answer this question for readers. So this model relies on logos. And again, look at the example in the textbook and see where they're asking a question and then how they're proposing an answer to that question. So of course, what you'll need for this model is a question that hooks readers' curiosity. It can't be just a generic question. It has to be something very intriguing that draws people into the research that you've done and makes them want to know the answer. So you also then have to have the answer to that question planned as part of your research project. You don't want to ask a question and then say, well, no one really knows the answer to that, or I can't really answer that here. The whole point of using this type of introduction is that you do have the answer and you're going to tell readers what it is. And that answer will be stated in your thesis. And that thesis will guide the exploration of that question and tell us what the answer is throughout the look of the entire project. So the question can either open the essay or it can be later in the introduction. And you can see the different examples there because there are two examples in your textbook. One that begins the whole paper with a question and one where the question is raised a little bit later in the introduction. So if you're comfortable having a more logos driven approach with a sort of format of question answer and having that logical connection between the two, this might be the type of model that works for you. But again, it really depends on if you have that intriguing question ready and if you're able to really provide a concrete answer to that question. The next one is the paradoxical introduction. This type of introduction will appeal to curiosity again, but in this case by pointing out what's unexpected. Your thesis then will argue and you're going to explain the implications of whatever is surprising, unknown, or unexpected about your topic. This model relies somewhat on pathos, where the logic of question answer is in the interrogative introduction. In this one, it's more about making the reader feel curiosity and surprise that something is so unexpected that they need to keep reading and they're hooked by the emotion of the unexpected. So in this case, you need a surprising angle on your issue, something that is unknown by most readers. And then you need a definite set of assumptions that most readers will have so that that way you can break those assumptions and surprise them with something new. And then finally, you'll need a strong argument for why those assumptions are wrong. You need that unexpected twist that people aren't thinking about. And again, you can look at the example in your textbook to see how that might work. I will give you a caution that this one is a little bit more of a difficult introduction to pull off unless you have something that's really surprising or new that um, other people haven't explored in your research before. The final model is the minding the gap introduction. In this type of introduction, you want to explain why readers have not received enough information about your topic, or perhaps why they have not received correct information. And then your project will explain what information has been missing. So you have to begin with an assumption about your topic and then challenge it by adding this new information. So this model will, will rely on both logos and pathos, and you can see the final example there in your textbook. What you need for this model is a topic where there is a definite gap in knowledge that you have identified. This is the most challenging introduction model because in most cases, you're probably not doing research that will be completely 100% original where you have identified a definite something that is missing. It's very hard to do that when you're entering the conversation at this stage when years and years of research have been conducted on your topic in most cases. However, if you're doing a topic that's rather new, then it might be that you're actually identifying something that has not been um, developed in your research at all. In this case, the Minding the Gap introduction might work best for you. You do need to be able to fill that gap in knowledge by giving a strong argument about why that gap exists and how it can be filled by you. So explaining why, what, what happened here that created this gap in knowledge, and then what. Explaining what is missing and how you will fill that gap. So this may be something that appeals to you if you're doing cutting edge research on a new type of social media, for example, as a pop culture form, or if you're doing a social issue that has become trending in, um, in pop culture that has not really been examined very much within pop culture. There might be 
room for you to explain why things have been overlooked and then what you're going to do and add to that conversation. But if you're looking at a topic that has a longer history, this will probably be a more challenging introduction model for you to use because there may not be as much for you to say that would be filling in a blank that's happened in the research. So consider that when you're thinking about using this model. Now that we've looked at the different models, we're going to close by having one final assignment that you can practice with. I'd like you to choose one model and draft a very short introduction for your project. Don't worry about mistakes or perfection at this point. This is a very messy draft and it's just for you. It's not going to be graded. When you're done though, I'd like you to reread it back to yourself and answer these questions. If this was not your essay, would you actually want to read further? If your answer is no, then maybe you need to look at a different model or you need to think about how to add something that would appeal to an audience, either through their logic or through their emotions, making it more persuasive to just get people to continue to read. Number two, is your thesis clearly related to the rest of the introduction? You need to make sure that that thesis makes sense. Does it actually refer back to the, the information that you've given so far? Number three, is there a true difference between what others have said about your topic and what you will say? Again, you don't have to have 100% original research, but you need to be moving the conversation forward in some way. So whether that's proposing some kind of change or telling us what the next step will be, there needs to be something that is your voice as distinct from the rest of the conversation. Number four, how else could you make your introduction more interesting for readers? What do you think is missing at this point? So after you've answered those questions for the first model that you wrote, I'd like you to choose one other type of model and redraft your intro from this different perspective. And then you can ask yourself, is it stronger? And what did you add or take away in order to use this different model? So again, things can be very messy here. Um, we are not going to be turning in a full draft just of the introduction. This is more for you to continue working on as you work towards that final draft of the entire research project, which will be up for peer review in a couple of weeks. I do encourage you, though, to go ahead this week and write your introduction in whatever form that you want to have it ready for the peer review. That way you're not waiting until right before the review to write the entire project, but instead you have a good, solid even if it's messy, introduction at this point during this week since you have that time. So keep experimenting with those models until you find the one that works best for you. Thanks.